Hi everybody, today is the second show for Call the Doctor. Uh, the title of that show is specifically because we're going to invite you to telephone in with your questions for tonight's special guest. But first I introduce my co-host. Thank you. I'm Jane Kitchen and I'm going to be representing you, the viewers. Um, my questions are not as sophisticated as, as the physicians who are here tonight. So when I think of things and think of maybe what you might be wanting to know, I will certainly be representing that. Plus, once again, we love phone calls. Um, last time, Dr. Perlmutter, I think you got four calls, and I mean, really good calls. They don't have to be excellent. You know, well, we calls, got more. <laughs> we only had time to address time. four of them on the air, but if we get them sooner, we'll address them sooner. We'll get more mm -hmm. calls in today. Today's guest is one of my partners. His name is Dr. Hardy Singh, and he is the shoulder specialist for North Carolina and several states surrounding it. Uh, Hardy, welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me. Today's topic will be shoulders. Shoulder anatomy, shoulder pathology, meaning the diseases that can affect the shoulder, and how Dr. Singh manages these pathologies. So let's start off by telling us a little bit about normal shoulder anatomy, and then we'll get in deeper from there. Absolutely. Um, so the shoulder, just by default, people think is just one joint, but really what it is is a conglomerate of the ball and socket that everybody agrees is the shoulder joint, but there's one more joint above it. We call that the acromioclavicular joint. There's a joint behind, which is the scapula, and then believe it or not, even the joint that comes and connects to the neck area called the sternal uh, the sternal joint that goes with the clavicle, that also, so all four joints, believe it or not, make the shoulder, and we have our expertise on the whole four joints, but mainly, like you said, the ball and socket joint off the upper extremity is what we call the shoulder joint. Tell us about the common ailments uh, that affect the shoulder. So uh, that's a good question. I, I would like to maybe answer that uh, almost divided in age category, if you want to call it younger generation, middle age generation, and That's a good older, way to do older it. generation. And so the younger generation think uh, sporting injury, throwing injury, uh, let's talk about overhead athletes or, or uh, mountain climbing or gymnastics. That would be the younger sort of mini trauma, trauma, sports injuries. Then the middle age is where where people talk about the rotator cuff injuries, which is a bread and butter injury of the shoulder, if there is one. And we'll explain what a rotator cuff Absolutely. is in a little bit. And, uh, and, and in the older age, of course, as any age joint talks, we talk about arthritis, we talk about wear and tear. So uh, those are the sort of, if you want to broadly classify those injuries, they fall into those three categories. Let's start off with athletic injuries, which okay. you classified as the younger generation, but in reality, they can happen in any age group. But generally speaking, athletic injuries happen in uh, mid-40s and younger. Yes, right? and, and believe it or not, today's population um, in our country is growing younger in the sense Folks in their mid 40s, mid 50s, 60s are still want to be active. They want to do a lot with their shoulder. They want to not compromise the quality of their life. So this sporting injury can expand five, four decades, if you want to call it that. And it's really, um, and if, if to explain a good sporting injury, I, I'm, I'm going to make it simple by saying, if if something bad happens between this ball and this socket or the structures surrounding the ball and socket due to extreme pressures. Uh, I'm wanting to throw the ball and my hand goes further back and further back. In other words, this ball goes further back. In other words, pushing on the structures on one end and relaxing on the structures on the other end, that would, at over time, probably cause some sort of wear, tear, injury, tendinitis, ligamentitis, itis meaning inflammation. And so with all those things in play, we have to then factor the nature of the sporting injury, the nature of the sport, how much forces are involved in just, for example, a baseball pitcher. Not many people realize that if I was to, um, if I was to, let's say I'm a 90 miles an hour fast pitch baseball pitcher, and if I was to throw the ball, if my hand was a machine, not many people realize that in one second, the speed at which I throw the ball, my hand would go around 6,000 times in one second. That's the amount of forces our shoulders 
undertake and, and handle for us to be able to continue to be active. So it's a lot of, uh, a lot of challenging ways to uh, fix these injuries, whether with or without surgery. And these forces don't just happen across the joint that you showed us. Let me see that model that you had for a second. So um, this is a, uh, a picture of the, uh, of the shoulder joint. Can we zoom in on this, um, if possible? Um, so we have a humerus bone, and we have a scapula bone. And where the two come together is a joint that's being held together by magnets in this model. Uh, in reality, there are no magnets, obviously, and it doesn't just stay there. Um, unlike a hip joint, which is to some degree more of a ball uh, being encased by bone, this is something the size of an average human, the size of a golf ball sitting in a teaspoon. Uh, but it's held in place by ligaments that come from the scapula, and a ligament is a, is a fibrous tissue that goes from bone to bone. And it encapsulates this and seals it together. Uh, and actually, uh, there's another lining in there that secretes a lubricating fluid. Uh, but it, the, uh, the overhead throwing athlete, or the lacrosse player, or the athlete who just falls on an outstretched arm, can tear the ligaments that hold these two bones together. Um, that's separate and distinct from a damage to the actual cartilage, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, uh, in separating out the generations again, let's, let's, we'll come back to the, to the athlete and how we fix that sure. ligamentous injury. As you get older, damage can occur to the actual cartilage, which in this model it's is blue. shown as blue. Um, and it's not really blue, um, uh, but to dis make it more distinct and visible, you're seeing it as blue in the model uh, from the manufacturer. Um, Let's talk about the more middle-aged to older people who end up with damage to the actual bone. And again, cartilage, let me regress just a little bit, um, is a Teflon-like coating that would be Teflon on a pan. Um, God gave us a slippery coating on the ends of our bones that have to touch another bone, and that's called cartilage. And they cap the two uh, pieces of bone that touch each other. So explain to us the stages of, car of cartilage damage, and then, and then we'll talk about what we do about that. Okay, so cartilage damage, whether directly or indirectly, let's just, for, for simplicity terms, just call it arthritis. What is arthritis? People ask all the time. And I like to tell them it's your uh, tire wearing off your rim, or it's your hair falling off your skull. In your case, you manage to tell them that it's this smooth, beautiful, nice, shiny, sliding surface so more blue means more normal, and we, we divide them typically into four stages. If you want to, again, keep it simple, about 25% is type one, 50, 20 out of 50, maybe type two, 50 to 75%. What does that mean? How much of blue do you have, and how much in this model, again, it's not blue, it's in real life, it's wear. And for example, in this particular model, if you can zoom in, it's mostly red, both on the ball side and the socket side. And so, just comparing this almost fully inflamed, fully completely degenerative lost cartilage versus a normal cartilage where everything is smooth and slides beautifully and there's no pain. So wear and tear of cartilage is called arthritis. Now how you get it, we can talk about that in different ways, but basically that's the gist of it. Right. So now let's go back to where we started with that throwing athlete, and let's talk about the type of conditions that, uh, that they would have that are not inclusive of a, a tear to the rotator cuff. Uh, for example, bursitis exactly. is a common thing that we see in the office, probably the single most common non-surgical disease that we see um, in a shoulder is bursitis. And it's easily treated, and, and typically it shows up uh, with a patient having trouble to sleep on that side or reach their hand up over their head. And now that may be a sign of a more significant pathology, but often uh, it's just the simple bursitis and that can be managed. Tell us how you treat and it. And so uh, let's, let's just talk about what is bursa, and itis meaning inflammation of the bursa, and it just so happens nature has placed, if you want even, I like to explain this to my patient, think of it like a 
air ball or a or a plastic air between two any bones. If we didn't have that, we'd be grinding like trees. Mm -hmm. So we kind of slide one joint over the other. In this case, we're talking about the ball and socket and the other joints we mentioned. But basically, when that air ball or the air pocket where the sliding mechanism goes bad, itis, inflammation, fluid, anger, redness, and, and, and where the grinding starts, we call it bursitis. Now, bursitis shouldn't happen by itself. There's probably some reason behind it. And in this case, if you're talking about you know, overhead athletes or throwing athletes or athletes who are doing a lot of uh, upper body exercises, sometimes they overdo it more than the body can handle. And the reaction to their whatever injury is, is bursitis. So we see the end product of their injury by calling it bursitis, but then that's where we dig in a little bit deeper to figure out what is the reason for the bursitis. How would you treat it? Say you say I'm coming to your office now and I'm not showing signs of anything really significant, but I really don't want to spend my copay for an MRI. Um, I really don't have time to go to therapy, uh, but it hurts to sleep on that side and it hurts when I pick my arm up and move. I have trouble putting my jacket or shirt on. I have trouble washing my hair in the morning. Or brushing my teeth. Just so, activities of daily living. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sh show me what type of signs somebody could expect to have, other than what I just said, that would make them think that, or make you think that they have bursitis, and tell us how you would treat it. So when that air pocket moves and it hurts, it's called bursitis. So for example, raising your hand overhead, reaching an upper counter, for example, in the kitchen, or picking something heavy, or pulling, or pushing, those symptoms and it, it just is nagging and, it, and you ask the patient and they say, yeah, in the last three months it's not, not only gotten better, it's actually slowly getting worse. I wake up at night uh, with some ache and I got to massage it or I got to put heat or cold on it. So those simple things folks will do, but itis, meaning inflammation, so we try our bread and butter anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy, we try to strengthen the core of the shoulder, which is called rotator cuff. I'm sure we'll talk about it soon. Those rotator cuff are, are basically balancing forces between the ball and socket, holding the ball into the socket as it moves around. So we try to work with those four, or if you want to argue five, core muscles of the shoulder, then that eventually, as the shoulder gets core stronger, the bursitis gets lesser and lesser. I want to throw out a, a cause of that also. Women tend to, some women carry pocketbooks that are way too heavy. <laughs> and I've, I worked with a physical therapist personally one time because I was in my job carrying everything in this bag. And it, it, it really did damage to my shoulder and it and took quite a while. And not just the shoulder, that. we're talking about the lower Her back, back, upper back, and neck. Right. Um, so roller bags or roller, you know, luggage bag type bags are better especially for the shoulder. And the other thing is the shoulder is very close to your your brain, if you want to call it. It's a very well perceived, it's a painful joint when it hurts. It's, it's hard to escape it. And it, I, I, I favored it and so I quit moving it and that brought on additional problems. Correct. And it's the only joint in the human body that does what we call 360 degree motion. Mm -hmm. So that makes it that much more easily injured mm -hmm. and that much more hard complex if you wait it and mm -hmm. wait it out longer and make that what m our Dr. Perlmutter was saying about bursitis becoming more than bursitis into something else. Do you ever take out the bursa? My mother had that done and I didn't know if that were still a, a way that people would treat. They took out an actual bursa sac. You mean with shoulder. surgery or? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So yes, I mean when we go in for surgery and bursitis is the end, like I said, end point of whatever else was going on. Mm -hmm. Our focus is, yeah, take out the bursitis, but also then fix the reason for the bursitis so this sure. doesn't become a recurring problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what the pathology is, we always work up the cause of it. And that's, that's the key to understand <coughs> that your symptom may be bursitis, but the cause of the bursitis still needs to be evaluated. Absolutely. And we'll talk about how we do further evaluations, but just to beat up the bursitis thing, one a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, say I'm your patient still, uh, but Dr. Singh, I can't take anti-inflammatories. I get an upset stomach. Even Advil 
upsets my stomach terribly. And I don't want to be one of the 16,000 Americans that die every year from simple over-the-counter or prescription anti-inflammatories. Yes. Um, so uh, we look at those as very safe class of medicines when in fact they're not. Uh, and so I know that they're dangerous and I really don't want it. Okay. So tell me how you're going to treat my bursitis because I can't play tennis. Okay, so for example, if you're not able to take a, what we call a non steroidal anti-inflammatory medication which damages your stomach lining for sure. In fact, we, we as orthopedic surgeons, we like to joke with our GI colleagues, so we keep you in business. Right. <laughs> we give so many anti-inflammatories because people have inflammation. But anyway, we can bypass the gut. We can bypass, um, the, we can go straight to the gist of the problem. In your case, you're, you're hand and wrist expert, and what you do with that is basically what I do with the shoulder. We can inject an anti-inflammatory steroid medication straight into the bursa, absolutely nicely suppressing the inflammation and healing it in that sense. But that's not the end of the treatment. We still want to add physical therapy. Again, right. not taking an anti-inflammatory medication. We can apply heat. We can apply cold. We can apply appropriate times of stretching. Activity restrictions. Absolutely. Some, some we restrict, some we say push a little bit harder, but re regardless, we get, get the patient through if they can avoid, and you're right, there are a lot of patients who have had gastric bypass surgeries or surgeries that do not let them take anti-inflammatory medication. We, we can work with that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. They said their shoulder hurts, uh -huh. but it goes up into their neck. Okay. They said, what could that be? So the question is, shoulder hurts, but it goes up into my neck. Now, I'd like to have a little bit more detail on what that is, but generally speaking, the shoulder and neck are kind of the hip and the lower back. They're kind of married, and we have to differentiate based on many clinical exams, whether it's a neck-related issue going to the shoulder or shoulder-related right. issue going to the neck, or is it a 50-50 call? Um, or is it a muscle that, that helps yeah. support the shoulder that's just in spasm? You know, for example, a trapezius muscle can go into spasm just with simple shoulder pathology. And some patients will come in and tell us that my neck is just killing me over here. And you find out that the real source of that pathology may in fact be their shoulder. Absolutely. And I work, we work very closely with a neck uh, specialist to say that with a neck person might call me up and say, this is not a neck issue, this is a shoulder issue. I have a patient and I do vice versa. We do that all the time. But really, you want to know what's more important. Where is the origination of that particular pathology? And nine out of 10 times, we can figure it out just with a f nice physical exam on the patient's neck and the shoulder. Yeah. So, so to summarize, bursitis can be injected. It can be given anti-inflammatory pills with great caution, and I think personally to throw this out there that you should never take an anti-inflammatory pill without taking a stomach protective medicine such as Nexium. Uh, Zantac off the market now. Uh, but medicines like that, I think in my practice, are one prescription doesn't get written without the other. Um, uh, believe they go together, and if your insurance <coughs> company doesn't pay for it, then I won't write you the prescription unless you take an over-the-counter at least strength of stomach protective medicine. I want to mention about steroid shots because a lot of people I know say, oh, I had that and it was just awful. No. And I've had one that was awful, but it doesn't have to be. Oh, right. absolutely. Um, so people shouldn't avoid that. So the other advancement, if you want to call it, within the sh world of injections is we also have started using ultrasound guided injections. I use them all the time. You can get deep into a joint, you can say superficial, you can give a do half a dose here and half a dose there mm -hmm. based on where the bursitis is or the inflammation is. And, and basically, and that was the, where I was going with this, was uh, with an ultrasound, uh, if you can zoom in again, uh, with an ultrasound guided uh, needle, if this is the bursa which lives into this space right up under here, let me see if I can hold it in a position where you can see, um, uh, the ultrasound, uh, very much like uh, you would do for monitoring a developing baby, we could put the ultrasound on the skin uh, and actually see the shoulder joint and we could watch the needle go right into the perfect location. Correct. No guesswork whatsoever. Uh, that plus numbing medicine, it's almost a painless experience The today. lidocaine ahead of time and let it take effect. Right. Makes a huge difference. And that's how we do it in our practice. and. Uh, and it does make a big difference. Um, now, if you've injected my bursa a couple times, uh -huh. um, 
and I'm a tennis player, and it's just not getting better. All right, uh, now my exam is consistent with a little bit of weakness. So weakness adds a new layer of complexity to your bursitis. And for I would, I would even go one step behind and work with your tennis trainer to see if your strokes are better or mechanically not good for your shoulder. But beyond that, if the bursitis has not gotten away with injections, physical therapy, heat, cold, stretching, and we are getting into weakness parts, now I'm thinking that we may need to start exploring this particular shoulder a little bit deeper. Let's talk about that because nothing is going to make my tennis stroke better. <laughs> so it's impossible. Okay, so, so then we're going to fix the issue. What We're going to fix the weakness. What is weakness coming from? Extreme amount of pain can do it. Um, a tear off your rotator cuff where you were just pointing out the bursa. Just below the bursa lives the rotator cuff. What's a rotator cuff? It's the, it's the hood of the the ball that comes through the socket, covers up the ball, and, and ball and socket kind of live in one, almost a vacuum, thanks to the rotator cuff, holding the ball in the socket. Like you said, it was a golf ball on a tee. So how does a golf ball stay on a tee? Through those muscles and ligaments we mentioned earlier. So bursitis now is a secondary phenomenon in your story to a rotator cuff pathology more likely than not. So I would try and start getting an x-ray. I would want to look for bone spurs. I would want to look for alignment. I would want to look for if there's any other thing beyond just a regular... Bone spurs? Did you just call me old? No. <laughs> I, I call your shoulder old. <laughs> <laughs> right. My shoulder's much older than I am. Um, uh, no, but on a serious note, the, the bone spurs can then start to kind of grind into your rotator cuff. And what's a bone spur? Just think of like an extra spur of bone, which is calcification, which kind of... It just continues to rub on that rotator cuff, and the rotator cuff is a you know a few a few millimeters thick. It continues to dig into it, and over time the inflammation starts, and inflammation gives to bursitis, tendonitis, rotator cuff tears, and that's where we have to start looking. I don't want anybody to start getting weak uh, over time, rather than where we were trying to get them stronger over time. That would be a not a not a good treatment. We need to take a break, according to. Um, control room, but one of the things you're going to talk about that I didn't know, and I want to just tell people kind of as a tease, you're doing laparoscopic shoulder surgery now, so that's Absolutely. a really exciting thing and a lot faster recovery time, so let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Thank you. The tank is on E, and your low tire pressure light is glaring at you again. You do not have time to wait in line and pay to put air in the tires, and you certainly don't want to get out of the car in the cold and pump gas. What if you could pull up to a gas pump and have an attendant run out to greet you to pump your gas, clean your windshield, and put air in the tire, all for no extra charge, while you step inside and enjoy a made-to-order breakfast or lunch? Does that kind of full service exist anymore? It does at JD's Grocery and Grill, a service station created to bring back the full service experience to all customers. JD's Grocery and Grill is a full service gas station. Eat in restaurant with tasty made-to-order food and a grocery store all in one. The staff at JD's Grocery and Grill is ready to field all requests and will help you find anything you need. Call them today at 252-972-5000 or stop on by at 1240 Atlantic Avenue. Store hours Monday through Saturday 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Grill hours Monday through Saturday 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. JD's Grill and Grocery at the heart of great food. Local businesses in Wilson, Nash, and Edgecombe counties have something to share with you. For cash loans, come and see us on gold, guns, and electronics, locally owned and operated. Hi everybody, it's Millie down at Don Bullock Chevrolet, and I'd love to hand you the keys to this beautiful trail boss. Come on down to Don Bullock Chevrolet and find out why we do it the better way at Don Bullock Chevrolet. Brought to you by WHIG and these fine businesses. 
I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitations and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. Hi, Jerry here at the Tar River Flea Market where you can find just about anything you want or need. From appliances to lawn equipment, from musical instruments to watches, from jeans to handcrafted jewelry, from pots to peanuts and popcorn, from electronics to ice cream, from coins to fragrant burning oils. The Tar River Flea Market has 40,000 square feet of indoor shops, 12 acres of outdoor vendors. Open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 9 to 5. Highway 301, South Rocky Mountain. See you there. Put your graduate in one of the safest, most dependable cars in the market. Put them in a Chevrolet. For three years in a row, J.D. Powers has awarded Chevrolet the most dependable cars on the road today. Don Bullock Chevrolet has over 30 different makes of new cars and trucks right now, and you can save thousands. Pre-owned or new, we have it at the price you want. Doing business the better way, Don Bullock Chevrolet. Welcome back, everybody, for the second half of our show. And we have a special guest for you that we'll bring in a little bit. We'll have George from Wilson, who's a patient that Dr. Singh has operated on and has uh, wants to share with you his experience working with us at Carolina Regional Orthopedics. Um, we started talking about arthroscopic surgery. And that's overwhelmingly, besides uh, shoulder replacement surgery, which I want to then go into, um, and that would be a good segue to, to, to bring George in. Um, almost all the surgeries uh, that are not shoulder replacements today are done arthroscopically. And, so, and I want to say that's where I said laparoscopically, and right. that's in your abdomen, right? Yeah, that would be going through your belly button so into your shoulder. That hasn't heard, been done yet. Heard of those, but that's the little <laughs> tiny incision. Right, a series of three, sometimes four very small incisions, about a quarter inch long, uh, uh, often some don't even need sutures. Often they just get one little tiny suture. Um, but um, through sp very specific parts around your shoulder, we can get access to the parts that give us disease. Uh, we talked a little bit about bone spurs. Yes. A bone spur, kind of like a stalactite and stalagmites, they stick down and they may stick up from uh, different uh, sh normal parts of the bony shoulder, and they can cut down into some of the tissues that God gave us that move our shoulder around. Um, so as in every joint, muscle comes from bone, then turns into a tendon, and the tendon attaches to the bone that has to move. Kind of like a motor turns into an axle, which turns into a wheel. Absolutely. And uh, the motor is our muscle, the tendon is our axle, and the joint is the wheel that we have to turn. Um, we're not talking about muscle pathology. What we're talking about is axle pathology. When he was talking a little bit earlier about the worn out shoulder joint, when uh, the cartilage was worn out, that's wheel pathology. W uh, pathology. Not real, but wheel. Um, when you have a torn axle or a torn tendon, um, we deal with that almost exclusively arthroscopically in a modern operating room today. Um, and so give us a little hint about how we go ahead and repair those. Now, the presumption is, using me as a patient again, I had my MRI, or a very careful physical examination by Dr. Singh, and it's quite definitive that I have a partial rotator cuff tear, or maybe a complete rotator cuff tear, meaning that the, the muscles that attach to the bone uh, are either partially pulled off or completely pulled off. And now I need to have them repaired. Right, so uh, a good a good way to figure out, one, whether it's torn or not, will be an MRI. And if it's torn, how big is the tear? Is it a centimeter? Is it a centimeter and a half? Is it two? Is it three? Is it one tendon, two tendons, three tendons? We try to figure that out. 
get a good idea of what we are tackling. But one of the most advanced things we have uh, accomplished in shoulder surgery, let's say in the last even uh, 15 to 20 years, uh, and we'll talk about anesthesia real quick and make it pain-free, how we have made lots of adv advancements there as well, but the rotator cuff tendon surgery, which is what we initially talked about, bread and butter, is the last time I opened a shoulder to do that tendon repair back to bone. You mean an incision when you say like open? An incision, when I say open, as in traditionally where we would you know, take skin to knife and actually get into the joint and open it traditionally, was maybe, I probably open one a year, if that, because you have to. But the camera Just way is, less than one percent. So yeah, out of maybe every six hundred, five hundred surgeries, it becomes an open surgery, which is very, very rare. So the camera surgery, and I'll, if I don't, uh, I'll show you if it. It's literally the 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 incision that we make on the skin is a, what we call a stab wound with a little knife, and we place a camera which looks very similar to this long pen and goes inside one camera looking at it and we bring two or three other similar, we call them portals or small holes to get in there and actually then fix the rotator cuff back to the bone either through anchors or through direct repair and we, the idea is to make it back secure and as we were talking earlier take out that bursa and that bone spur you mentioned I always go after it and take it out because I don't want that rotator cuff to return. Correct. And by repairing it, we mean literally getting uh, suture and needle and sewing it together. And Correct. sometimes if it's pulled off the bone, uh, we, uh, you mentioned the term anchors. There's very modern devices which are kind of like baby grappling hooks that we place into the bone. They anchor into the bone and don't pull out. And from those very, very small anchors come very modern sutures that are made out of uh, man-made materials like Kevlar, the same stuff that we make bulletproof vests out of, super strong stuff. And that sews that rotator cuff back down to bone Absolutely. in a super strong fashion, uh, assuming that the technique is done perfectly. And, and that allows us to do one more thing that we didn't used to be able to do, and that's get them into therapy right away. So the advantage of otoscopic surgery over traditional, what we call open surgery or making an incision surgery, is you have not invaded all the other muscles to get to the rotator cuff, mm -hmm. right? then invading them back by suturing them back on your way out. So that trauma is eliminated. Mm -hmm. So you're going straight to the core of the problem, so which is why people are getting back to work faster, people are having much, much, much less pain than traditional open surgeries about 15, 20 years ago. People are back to rehab faster, and physical therapy, of, of course, is part and parcel of my, my daily treatment for my patients. I will uh, probably tell you that if surgery is important, I give equal importance to physical therapy for fixing that surgical rehab post-operatively because I don't want to get a frozen shoulder in my patient or get that bursitis come raging back or, or we missed the boat where we had to stretch the patient and we didn't. Um, help the patient through stretching, strengthening, and get through the rehab. So the, it's a joint team effort between what the patient being in the core of it, but then the surgeon, the physical therapist, the nurse, the, the assistants, the x-ray techs, everybody comes together to make sure that the patient hits that finish line on time. We've stressed this on the first show that it's it's definitively a team approach. Um, my words a month ago or, or so were that I do 33%, the patient does 33% and the therapist does 33%. If one of us doesn't show to the party, you get a 66%, yeah. if, if assuming everybody else gave you a full home run effort. And a 66 is still a failure in any grade book. Absolutely. So all three have to step up to the plate. I have to do a perfect job. The therapist has to do a perfect job. And the patient has to participate. Right. You know. Dr. Singh, what would you say to the person watching who is in a lot of pain and just says, but I've heard it's a nightmare type surgery. I'm really scared of it. Address that. Because a lot of people are probably thinking that. 
Right, and I, I like to uh, jokingly call it the, the plane crash news. When the plane crashes, we all talk about it, but when the plane lands and takes off perfectly, we don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. So that one patient who's had maybe a bad outcome or a painful outcome ha will tell a lot more people than a patient who's doing well. Mm -hmm. But I will go ahead and tell you that the advancement in back to the otoscopic surgery, the techniques within otoscopic surgery, the, the speed of surgery, um, they have all actually changed lives much, much, in much, much faster and, and have actually gotten a lot more. Surgery now, if I may, is not a not unpleasant experience anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, uh, surgery doesn't equal pain and howling and screaming anymore. In fact, most people have less pain the day after their rotator cuff repair than they did the night before. Well, and one of the things when you started this show was you were saying, you looking at camera and saying, you don't have to hurt. You don't have to you hurt. Need you don't to, have to need hurt. You need to just, I mean, because I think a lot of people in our area think this is my way of life and this is the way I'm going to have to be. And it certainly is worth it. And everything that you all have shared with me, you don't rush into surgery. Surgery is what's done if other techniques and other things don't, don't work. That's right. And even if you do have to go to surgery, Let's talk a little bit about the anesthesia. Absolutely. Um, every single modern hospital uh, has enrolled anesthesiologists now that have very special training, mm -hmm. particularly for shoulder surgery and my upper extremity surgery. That means that you just pretty much need twilight sleep. You don't have to get a tube in your throat in most cases. Um, you don't get intubated is our word for it. Um, and you're numbed up before the surgery and you don't know what's going on. Uh, but when you wake up, so to speak, you don't wake up in any pain whatsoever. And we overlap that with long acting numbing medicines and, and then oral medication. So there's a nice transition from uh, how we treat you immediately before the surgery, during the surgery, after the surgery and your medications at home, and they blend perfectly. Tell us a little bit about how the type of anesthesia that you like for your surgery. So the anesthesia that I would insist on on my patients would be what's known as an interscalene block. That's not important. What's important is the nerves that go to the shoulder have been blocked for surgery. And I like to use a longer acting pain medication. And by block, you mean they're numbed up? They're numbed up. So for example, my patients will not even know they've had surgery for two to three days after surgery because the numbing medicine is continuing to keep the shoulder pain free and that's a very critical time because that's when the patient has a bad experience. That's when the, the start of a bad experience like you said. And not every surgeon uses those techniques Correct. by the way. Um, if, if I was to, and again I'm old enough to tell you that I've used this anesthesia now. I've also seen the when this was not around the moment the, way the patient woke up and opened their eyes, they had pain. Mm -hmm. And that's, nobody wants that. No. Today, patients, the first question out of their mouth is, am I, what, are you telling me I'm in the recovery room already? I don't trust you. <laughs> right, it's very common. Mm -hmm. so, the sensation of pain is literally non-existent in our recovery rooms right. from the surgeries that we do. You mentioned intubate, and a lot of people watching um, watch, might not know what that is. In other words, they, you don't have general anesthesia, and a lot of people You're are really scared of that. You're not getting a tube in your throat breathing because for you. Because of nausea and, and right. after effects. So this, you're able to, to isolate right. the area, and then the twilight is like general, general relaxing. Your eyes are closed. You don't know what's going on. Uh -huh. uh, you can't respond to, something, to a question that's asked of you, and we wouldn't try to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. You're functionally uh, in a light sleep. Um, and uh, and we like do that a GI procedure, for example, a colonoscopy, colonoscopy. or something mm -hmm. like that. It's very very comfortable, and and some people are in fear of waking up during my surgery. Right. Just doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen. And you, and you also keep their pain under control after. I mean, not with with um, opioids and whatnot, but you give them injections and you keep it Correct. such that they Correct. are not hurt. Right. Yeah, we we've, we've figured out over time what works and what gives the least side effect. Uh -huh. um, narcotics is not the way to go anymore. Um, you don't have to get constipations and nauseas and vomitings and all the side effects of all the strong pain medicine. We can bypass that through other means. For example, the numbing of the nerve we talked about. 
sim simple things like Tylenol, something mm -hmm. simple like an injection after surgery. Mm -hmm. Both me and Dr. Perlmutter believe in doing stem cells and uh, platelet-rich plasmas, things that heal your surgery faster. Mm -hmm. um, and stimulate healing more. Stimulate healing, get to that pain-free level faster. So we are, we are not, if this is the problem, call it whatever, we are attacking it from every angle we can find. Mm -hmm. So we do less of everything else and get that multimodal pain initiation onto that shoulder, onto that wrist, onto that back. So, so let's talk about that person who comes to us. We, we see it every day in our practice. Who was that person that you were talking about who was afraid to get it fixed, right? Yeah. They, knew, they were told they had a rotator cuff tear 10 years ago, um, and they just said, but I'll live with it. I'm not going to get it fixed. Well, that pain doesn't go away. Not only did they live for 10 years in, in notable discomfort, but that pain got progressive. And then they went from being able to pick their hand up over their head to not being able to pick it up any more than this. They can't put a shirt on on that side. Um, the muscles and, atrophy, right? Right. They start getting their hair cut shorter. Women wear, <laughs> become spinners, not reachers for bras. Uh, earrings and necklaces stop being put on. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you make these adaptable changes because you just can't reach the top of your head. You can't reach your back. Um, and uh, all types of athletic activities stop and you gain weight. Um, all because you're afraid of a surgical procedure, which truly hurts typically less the day after the surgery than it did before. So what I want to do is use that as a segue to introduce our special guest tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, our special guest is George. He's from Wilmington, North Carolina. That's right. Uh, Dr. Singh has operated on both of his shoulders. Um, and what happens when a rotator cuff is chronically torn and ignored is not quite dissimilar than if you had a nail this big sitting in the side wall of your tire and you said, well, I'm just going to put fix a flat in it. I'm not going to fix my, uh, take the nail out and fix the tread. Let us uh, just ignore it till the tire blows up. When the rotator cuff is not repaired, the tire blows up. It really gets bigger and worse. Oh, what do you do with your patients when they have a completely destroyed, <coughs> excuse me, rotator cuff, and all that you see is the raw bone left on there because now it's raw bone grinding in the raw bone. Tell us how you treat it. I haven't fixed one of those problems since uh, 4 p.m. today. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> so, but but like you were talking earlier, if the ball and socket marry each other through the ligaments and the rotator cuff. And the ligaments and the rotator cuff have a tear or pathology and there's a big hole in there. Now the ball and socket are not in unison with each other. They are working against each other. And patient hurts. They can't, like you were saying, can, can lift. And they hear and the grinding it's noise. It's only six inches from your ear. Right. <laughs> you, patients so report hearing. hearing the grinding. So when you try to move their arm, you hear the grinding, and that just doesn't have to be. Right. But when somebody has a, a rotator cuff that's horribly injured from uh, an irreparable tear, one that couldn't be fixed, uh, or from other reasons, uh, what's the modern way of fixing that? We used to try to fix it with grafts and, and largely they failed. We tried a lot of things and we eventually, depending on the patient's age and their activity level, there's something on the shoulder replacement surgery that bypasses the rotator cuff. Makes it not needed anymore. Not needed anymore because there's one more muscle, the outside muscle, we call it the deltoid. We take that deltoid into action and say, Hey, Mr. Deltoid, can you help us do what the rotator cuff was doing earlier? And they get pretty decent outcomes, don't they? Get they get very decent outcomes. Meaning pain. that the pain drops down to really wonderful levels and where the functionality not, uh, goes up. Uh, it, this is ironic. We are sitting in Rocky Mount. The first patient who had a reverse shoulder replacement surgery, I did it at Duke back in 2004 on uh, 16th October at 9 p.m., but that's not important. He was a pilot here at the local airport and he could take off and land with his injured shoulder but he couldn't reach up and hit all those buttons. Mm -hmm. All he wanted to do was a pain-free takeoff and a pain-free landing. So we did his reverse, first reverse shoulder in the United States of America was a patient from Rocky Mount. There you go. And, with, uh, and, and it was so funny if you want to segue into that and George Jones is right here. Yeah. George, a question. Yes. Do you have a question? Let's, while George walks onto the screen, we'll take a, a call from our guest. Yes, he wants to know, he said he has no reason to believe he has a rotator cuff injury because he hasn't done anything to it. 
but it hurts when he lifts his arm. It did hurt when he lifted his arm. He said, would a rotator cuff stop hurting? Would it just stop? Yes, at, had, at the cost, the, the rotator cuff will stop hurting at the cost of the shoulder not working. So you are compromising one for the other. Uh, typically when the rotator cuff is hurting, now if, if, if my rotator cuff was only five tendons, there, there are a million fibers, but let's say there were five. The fact that five became four, four became three, three became two, that's the, that's the reason they're hurting. The fibers are tearing at a microscopic level again and again, and the shirt hole and the shirt's getting bigger and bigger, and the fibers are tearing. That's what's hurting. But it's the pain's going to go away when I stop doing activities right. that would otherwise provoke it. And so we give up many of our normal activities of daily living or it's recreation. Uh, what we modify our work activities. Uh, uh, the actual tear in the rotator cuff rarely heals itself. Uh, unless you're 18, maybe 19 years and younger, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's hard to. Is it safe to say the sooner one comes to get help, the less damage has been done? So the quicker, not only avoiding all that pain, but there's less that would need to be done. You mean prevention is better than cure? Yeah, Absolutely. or, or to come really quickly. And the sooner they come, the, the less likely the they would need to even think about surgery. Okay. Right. Non-surgical choices become more effective the earlier that you come. But again, so. as you said, uh, you feel better usually the day after the surgery than you did before you went in. So that's, that's just correct. amazing. Yeah. No, so this is George standing behind me. I've known this man for a dozen years at this point. Uh, I've known him since I was in Raleigh and practicing there. I've known his, uh, known his father, known his family. And this is a man who came to see me, if you want to cut short his whole story into one line, he said, I don't want to compromise my life. You keep fixing my shoulders. He was one of those attitude where I, if I'm a golfer, I'm going to continue to golf. If I'm a thrower, I'm going to continue to throw. In his case, he's a martial art expert. He is, uh, I call him a rock climber. He is, his <laughs> his uh, nature of his work is such that it, a lot of overhead heavy lifting work. And he's a tough, fit guy. But he did not want to be in pain. And he did not want to compromise his activity. Over years, we have, uh, George, tell us what, two, two surgeries on one shoulder because it kept tearing and... Well, when I first met you, the extent of my injury was so severe that I didn't want to let anyone just handle it. And Correct. Dr. Sane was the expert in the field. He had handled a lot of athletes. And he had a lot of plaques hanging on the wall, and I knew that he would be the one <laughs> that would put me back together, and I could be able to use my shoulder and have a better quality of life. And that's the kind of, you know, today I would call him more of a friend than a patient, but he, uh, he has stuck through his shoulder pains, and he's been through a lot, but he's pain-free today, and he's functioning with both his shoulders, and he... Ask me that question again today. Can I do push-ups? Can I pick up heavy weight? And so, you know, we, we've gone through this talk a few times. Show us the model that you have Absolutely. at the end of so what, what a what shoulder George replacement has. looks like. Now, so let's just compare it to the, if you don't mind, holding the ball and socket right there. If I was to... Could you zoom in, please? And you've had a complete shoulder replacement? So yes. there's a ball and socket that you're holding, which is a natural shoulder or normal shoulder. If I was to replace that blue, we talked about the cartilage, with a metal on one side and a plastic on the other side, that would be a shoulder replacement surgery, very much like people get knee replacements or hip replacements, sometimes ankle replacements. But the bottom line is we are not letting the bone touch bone, like it was happening in this example. So we replace the ball for the ball, socket for the socket. That's called a sh total shoulder replacement. That's the standard way of doing it. That's the standard way of doing for it. the last 30, 40 years. Correct. Right. Now, when we talk about the rotator cuff being so bad, right. so torn, such a big hole, irreparable, we call it, then we cannot do the ball for the ball and socket for the socket. Is that because the rotator cuff, which normally makes this ball and socket move, 
uh, is hard. not functional right. anymore. For the same reason you couldn't function a rotator cuff tear is the same reason you wouldn't be able to function a cold and, and for a decade, what surgeons have done was use the only tools only. that are available to them and do this surgery even knowing that although the pain will go down, the patient's not going to move their arm normally. Yeah. They were shooting for pain free. That's right. it. They were even not shooting for function. But now we can in we can increase function now we and get rid of pain. Correct. So now when the ball, ball socket, socket, we call it a total shoulder. However, if we take the ball and put socket in where the ball was, okay, and take the socket and put a ball on it, and we marry those two together, we so call it... So you've switched the components. I've switched ball for socket and socket for ball. And you would say, and in fact, that Rocky Mountain patient that had it um, had an x-ray by an outside provider, and that outside provider called me and said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Why did you put ball you did for it back, You did it backwards. You did it backwards. So the bottom line is like this particular socket, as it gets into that ball, now does not have to depend on the rotator cuff that was already torn. Mm -hmm. It's depending on this outside deltoid muscle to lift the arm, to move the arm, to function the arm. And so, and pain free. Right. So when a patient comes and says, you know, hey doc, you know, I can't do this. I said, I'll get you pain free. I'll get you into rehab. And whatever your deltoid will give you back, you got that much of a shoulder function. And there are patients who I can, they will lift both their arms and I, I, I don't know which one had the reverse. Show us, George. See? Wow. And would you know that George has had multiple surgeries? Ultimately finishing in, in, in a shoulder replacement surgery. How many of you had five on this one shoulder, and this one was just done November the twentieth. And you're paying for. Would you start it? behaving now, please, George? <laughs> <laughs> I want to mention that you live in Wilmington now, but yes. you started working with Dr. Singh when you were in Raleigh and Rocky Mountain. In Rocky Mountain, he was in Raleigh. So he yeah. followed him he's, everywhere. He's been uh, following him yeah, wherever he's gone. That's where I've gone. And so did I recommend my dad when he had to have just an orthoscopic surgery done. Where he did both the of camera, his The camera surgery. With the cameras and he had from the, yeah. I mean, total recovery, no pain. Yes. Quality is worth chasing, which is why we invited Dr. Singh to be part of our group. And I'm delighted to be here and it's, it's a great, great uh, community and uh, we feel that we can do good work here. We can. Uh, Dr. Martin is a fixture in our practice. He's an amazing surgeon uh, uh, into partial retirement, so he's still seeing a few patients, but um, you've, uh, you've uh, filled the void that that excellent surgeon is, has created by slowing down wonderfully. Yeah, me and Dr. Martin had a telephone conversation and lo and behold, here I am. <laughs> How long does it take to recover when you do a reverse total shoulder? So that's a great question. What I like to do is protect them for a couple of days, three days, just to let the incision kind of heal, get the covers off, so to speak. And this is not done arthroscopically. This, this is open surgery. This is this an is open incision. surgery that makes an incision in front of the shoulder right. to replace the ball and socket. But basically you're waiting for that surgery to heal. The shoulder per se is ready to go. So we're waiting just for the inflammation from a bigger a, incision a week, to calm down. Two weeks, uh, not in George's case. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but typically I'll say come off the sling after that numbing medicine is worn off and start moving it. In fact, I get physical therapy involved and if physical therapist can come to your house, we let them come to your house and give you that service. If you have to go to a physical therapist, that's great too. So we do that and, uh, and basically from a shoulder's perspective, I like to tell my patients, if it allows you to do X, go ahead and do X. There is no true restriction coming from the surgeon's perspective to that reverse shoulder. Now the regular shoulder replacement, I protect them for three weeks because there's a particular rotator cuff muscle that we have to protect. Right. And that takes about three weeks to start healing. That we will delay. So today I did two or three total shoulders. One of them was reversed. In fact, the person who got the reverse is already three weeks ahead on schedule, as compared to the other two. So uh, it's okay. But the end point still is pain-free, good functioning, better shoulder than before, without pain. Right. And so the message here is 
just don't wait if you have pain. There's no need. You don't have to live with it. None of the surgical procedures that we're talking about today are really insurmountable. How much? How long were you taking pain medicine? Not on the one that had five surgeries, but on the one on the other one. Five. Here, not, not long at all. No. So because we, we use that numbing medicine, we use right. medicine inside the shoulder after surgery to supplement the numbing medicine. And right. even with the extensive surgery that I had here. George has, had, George has had surgery all the way from shoulder to all the way down to his elbow. That's how long his... Uh, right. So the take-home message is, because I think we have to wrap it up here, is don't live in pain. Um, George, thank you for coming. Dr. Yeah, Singh, you're you amazing. Do you know uh, who's going to be on next time? I do. Uh, we have a, a, another doc uh, from Raleigh. He's uh, leaving the area to take a fellowship in wilderness medicine. Um, and he is a snake bite expert. Uh, expert. Uh, Sean Bush is his name, and he's going to be here talking to us about uh, how to avoid snake bites and mm -hmm. what to do if you get that. And that's on June 15th. That's Tuesday, correct. June 15th, so you don't want to miss that either. So. Right, and that'll be followed by Dr. Glenn McNichol, who will talk about non-surgical ways of controlling your pain. Mm -hmm. He's a pain management specialist. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I love learning from these, and I'm sure everybody watching at home, too. I mean, I'm, now I'm going to be a cheerleader for y'all because I'm going to go out, and if somebody says my shoulder hurts, I'm going to say you need to get it looked at right perfect. now. Don't wait. <laughs> and remember, you can call in to our show. It's called Call the Doctor. We'll take live calls on the air. If you don't feel comfortable speaking on air, you don't have to. You can read your question to us, and we'll, we'll air it for you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.